Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Burden by Agatha Christie, writing as Mary Westmacott. Uh, so she, as well as writing her crime novel, she wrote a bunch of other novels under this pseudonym. Uh, this is the penultimate one for me, I have one more left to read after this one. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, The Burden. Laura Franklin bitterly resented the arrival of her younger sister, Shirley, an enchanting baby loved by all the family. But Laura's emotions towards her sister changed dramatically one night when she vowed to protect her with all her strength and love. While Shirley longs for freedom and romance, Laura has to learn that loving can never be a one-sided affair, and the burden of her love for her sister has a dramatic effect on both their lives. Based on Agatha Christie's metaphor, sometimes you have not the right currency, and then someone else has to pay. Uh, and it's billed as a story of consequences when love turns to obsession. So you have this little bit which I enjoyed. Uh, why on earth should I? demanded Mr. Franklin. Dogs, in my opinion, are a nuisance, always coming in with muddy paws and ruining the carpets. A dog, said Mr. Baldock, in his lecture room style, which was, in which was capable of rousing almost anybody to violent irritation, has an extraordinary power of bolstering up the human ego. To a dog, the human being who owns him is a god to be worshipped, and not only worshipped, but in our present decadent state of civilization, also loved. The possession of a dog goes to most people's heads. It makes them feel important and powerful. And then Mr. Baldock has this little rant about women here, jeez. Doesn't anyone have a dust in here, Laura asked, as she sat down sedately. Not if they value their lives, said Mr. Baldock. But mind you, it's a hard fight. Nothing a woman likes better than to come barging in, flicking a great yellow duster, and armed with tins of greasy stuff smelling of turpentine or worse. Picking up all my books and arranging them in piles, by size as likely as not. No concern for the subject matter. Then she starts an evil-looking machine that wheezes and hums, and out she goes finally, as pleased as punch, having left the place in such a state that you can't put your hand on a thing you want for at least a month. Women. What the Lord God thought he was doing when he created woman, I can't imagine. I dare say he thought Adam was looking a little too cocky and pleased with himself, Lord of the Universe and naming the animals and all that. Thought he needed taking down a peg or two, dare say that was true enough. But creating a woman, but creating woman was going a bit far. Look where it landed the poor chap, slap in the middle of original sin. And then Laura says I'm sorry, even though she shouldn't be sorry because it's not real <laughs> anyway and even if it was it wasn't her fault and mr baldock's looking about the roses he says on the whole i prefer them to human beings uh, they don't last as long for one thing we we get this uh, little bit of conversation has the little girl gone yes yeah, she's gone oh dear she didn't stay very long did she quite long enough said mr baldock children and one's social inferiors never know when to say goodbye one has to say it for them <laughs> later on he says drat all children give them an inch and they took an l he didn't like children anyway, he never had. He took an L. What? Oh, like, uh, this, this, like, uh, this little bit of dialogue is interesting. Arthur Franklin, following his wife out onto the terrace, said, Why do women have to talk such nonsense to babies? Hey, Laura, don't you think it's odd? I don't think it's nonsense, said Laura. Don't you? What do you think it is, then? He smiled at her teasingly. Teasingly, ugh. I think it's love, said Laura. He was a little taken aback. Great line here. That's where cats have the advantage over human beings, said Mr. Baldock. When they want to get away from people, they can climb a tree. The nearest we can get to that is to shut ourselves in the lavatory. Laura looked slightly shocked. Lavatories came into the category of things which Nanny, the late Nanny, had said little ladies don't talk about. So uh, I want to read this bit out in its entirety because I think it's a fascinating package. Uh, Spare me the horrid details, said Mr. Baldock. How do you read a book? Begin at the beginning and go right through. Yes, don't you? No, said Mr. Baldock. I take a look at the start, get some idea of what it's all about. Then I go on to the end and see where the fellow has got to and what he's been trying to prove. And then, then I go back and see how he's got there and what's made him land up where he did. Much more interesting. Laura looked interested but disapproving. I don't think that's the way the author meant his book to be read, she said. Of course he didn't. I think you should read the book the way the author meant. Ah, said Mr. Bulldog, but you're forgetting the party of the second part, as the blasted lawyers put it. There's the reader. The reader's got his rights, too. The author writes his book the way he likes, has it all his own way, messes up the punctuation and fools around with a sense any way he pleases. And the reader reads the book the way he wants to read it, and the author can't stop him. You make it sound like a battle, said Laura. I like battles, said Mr. Baldock. The truth is, we're all slavishly obsessed by time. Chronological sequence has no significance whatsoever. If you consider eternity, you can jump about in time as you please. But no one does consider eternity. Laura had withdrawn her attention from him. She was not considering eternity. She was considering Shirley. And watching that dedicated, devoted look, Mr. Baldock was again conscious of a vague feeling of apprehension. And uh, 
Another, a bit here I wanted to read out. Mr. Baldock again, he says, You women, trouble with all of you is, you make such a song and dance about things. How is one ever to know what's wise or not? If young Shirley goes to London and picks up with an Egyptian student and has a coffee-coloured baby in Bloomsbury, you'll say it's all your fault. Whereas it will be entirely Shirley's and possibly the Egyptians. And if she trains and gets a good job as a secretary and marries her boss, then you'll say you were justified. All bunkum. You can't arrange other people's lives for them. Either Shirley's got some sense or she hasn't. Time will show. If you think this London idea is a good plan, go ahead with it. But don't take it so seriously. That's the whole trouble with you, Laura. You take life seriously. It's the trouble with a lot of women. And then she goes, and you don't. And he says, well, I take bindweed seriously because he's into gardening. Uh, Henry says, I wonder if you ought to come and meet my aunt. I'm afraid that it will be an awful bore for you. I'm sure I shouldn't be bored, said Shirley politely. I don't see how you could help it, said Henry. She does horoscopes and has queer ideas about the pyramid. And uh, here we get somebody asking somebody to marry them. Asking. He says, Darling, you're so lovely. I want to marry you. You must marry me. You must. You must. Fuck you. And uh, we get this just little exchange. What have you been doing? Playing tennis at Roehampton. I went to Roehampton University. It's in uh, southwest London, near, near Barnes and Putney. Jesus, we get this as well. Yes, Henry really is a fiend. I try to be sorry for him, but I can't. You women, hard-hearted, sentimental about dead birds and things like that, and hard as nails when a poor fellow is going through hell. It's Shirley who's going through hell. He just goes for her. Naturally, only person he can take it out of. What's a wife for if you can't let loose on her in times of trouble? Jesus fucking Christ. And uh, I just want to read this one last line here. Uh, I want to hear all you can tell me about her, but, but don't say consoling things to me. You still believe in God, I suppose. Well, I don't. I'm sorry if that seems a crude thing to say, but you'd better understand what I feel. If there is a God, he is cruel and unjust. Yes, very true. So overall, The Burden by Agatha Christie. I mean, going back through and reading these bits out, I actually enjoyed reading these bits out a lot more than I enjoyed the book as a whole. So I feel as though, in general, the book itself is there but um, it does have some nice parts to it. Uh, I gave it a three out of five in my uh, website review. I think I'm gonna revise, no, it's still actually, it's not quite a 3.5, it's a strong three out of five. Um, but yeah, The Burden by Mary Westmacott slash Agatha Christie. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Burden. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.